Lily's life changes drastically. Her father becomes ill and dies, and Lily and her mother move from one relative's house to another. Their life is full of dinginess and despair. Only one thought consoled her mother, the contemplation of Lily's beauty. She studied it with a kind of passion as though it were some weapon she had slowly fashioned for her vengeance. It was the last asset in their fortunes, and she watched it jealously as though it were her own property and Lily its mere custodian. <laughs> she tried to instill into the latter a sense of responsibility. Lily was duly impressed by the magnitude of her opportunities, but her ambitions were not as crude as Mrs. Bart's. There was in Lily a vein of sentiment which gave an idealizing touch to her most prosaic purposes. She liked to think of her beauty as a power for good, and she would not have cared to marry a man who was merely rich. She was secretly ashamed of her mother's crude passion for money. Lily's preference would have been for an English nobleman <laughs> with political ambitions and vast estates, or for second choice, an Italian prince with a castle in the Apennines and an hereditary office in the Vatican. <laughs> <laughs> How long ago and far off it all seemed. Those ambitions were hardly more futile and childish than the earlier ones which had centered about the possession of a French jointed doll with real hair. Was it only ten years since she had wavered between the English Earl and the Italian Prince? After two years of hungry roaming, Mrs. Bart had died, died of a deep disgust. She hated dinginess, and it was her fate to be dingy. Her visions of a brilliant marriage for Lily had faded. Lily was beginning to have fits of angry rebellion against fate when she had longed to drop out of the race and make an independent life for herself. But what manner of life would it be? She was too intelligent not to be honest with herself. She hated dinginess as much as her mother had hated it, and to her last breath, she meant to fight against it. Lily's engagement to Percy Bryce seems imminent, but she hesitates. When Lawrence Selden arrives, Lily breaks an appointment with Grice to see him. On a walk, Selden explains his ideal, freedom from money, from poverty, from anxiety, as a citizen of what he calls a republic of the spirit. Lily says she understands the appeal of this, but he says she won't be admitted to his republic because she'll marry someone very rich. It's as hard for rich people to get into as the kingdom of heaven. That's unjust because one of the conditions of citizenship is not to think about money, and the only way not to think about money is to have a great deal of it. <laughs> you might as well say that the only way not to think about air is to have enough breath. True enough, but your lungs are thinking about the air if you are not. And so it is with your people. They may not be thinking of money, but they're breathing it all the while. Take them into another element and see how they squirm and gasp. Lily sat gazing absently through the blue rings of her cigarette smoke. It seems to me, she said, that you spend a good deal of your time in the element you disapprove of. Selden replied, yes, but I have tried to remain amphibious. It's all right as long as one's lungs can work in another air. The real alchemy consists in being able to turn gold back again into something else, and that's the secret that most of your friends have lost. Ah, you are as bad as the other sectarian, she exclaimed. Why do you call your republic a republic? It is a closed corporation, and you create arbitrary objections in order to keep people out. It is not my republic. If it were, I should have a coup d'etat and seat you on the throne. Whereas, in reality, you think I can never even get my foot across the threshold. Oh, I understand. You despise my ambitions. You think them unworthy of me. Selden smiled, but not ironically. Well, isn't that a tribute? I think them quite worthy of most of the people who live by them. She gazed on him gravely. But isn't it possible that if I had the opportunities, I might make better use of them? Money stands for all kinds of things. Its purchasing quality isn't limited to diamonds and motor cars. Not in the least. You might expiate your enjoyment of them by founding a hospital. 
But if you are, think they are what I should really enjoy, you must think my ambitions are good enough for me. Selden met this appeal with a laugh. Ah, oh, my dear Miss Bard, I am not divine providence to guarantee you are enjoying the things you are trying to get. <laughs> and the best you can say for me is that after struggling to get them, I probably shan't like them. She drew a deep breath. What a miserable future you foresee for me. Well, have you never foreseen it for yourself? The slow color rose to her cheek, drawn deep from the wells of feeling, as if the effort of her spirit had produced it. Often and often, she said, but it looks so much darker when you show it to me. He made no answer, and for a while they sat silent while something throbbed between them in the wide quiet of the air. But suddenly she turned on him with a kind of vehemence. Why do you do this to me, she cried. Why do you make the thing I have chosen seem hateful to me if you have nothing to give me instead? <clears throat> The words roused Selden. He himself did not know why he had led their talk along such lines. It was one of those moments when neither seemed to speak deliberately, when an indwelling voice in each called to the other across unsounded depths of feeling. No, I have nothing to give you instead, he said, sitting up and turning so that he faced her. If I had, it should be yours, you know. She dropped her face on her hands and he saw that for a moment she wept. <laughs>